Felix and Tony. Welcome back to another episode of On the Trail with Felix and Tony. This is episode number 11. I'm Felix Camacho. I'm running for governor in the upcoming 2022 general election. And joining me every week and every moment on the trail on this ca- of this campaign is my running mate, Senator Tony Ada. Good morning, Senator. Off a day. Off a day. So today will be a little different. We want to dedicate this episode to questions that we've received through our social media platforms. We've received so many questions that this kind of episode is... Absolutely needed. Yes. And so let's go through uh, this week on the trail, and then we'll jump right into the questions. So Sounds great. You know, right. we had a very busy week. Uh, started out with Sunday. We had that wonderful pocket meeting down in uh, Hoggett with uh, our, our, um, oh, yeah. our our new form merger of the Camacho Ara and the uh, Senecola Salas Mantanani uh, uh, village organizations. And... Uh, it was it was a wonderful turnout. I think in the on the onset they were told we were told ah, just you know just some few people just coming together to uh, you know just to uh, meet with you. When we got there, were you surprised as I was that mm-hmm. how many cars and how many people were there? Well, when they say small <laughs> in in our southern villages and in this case it was Agate, uh, I think small is no less than a hundred. <laughs> Yeah, I'm beginning to figure that out now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it start. We started out the week with that that uh, that pocket mo- pocket meeting, mm-hmm. and then we had the uh, American Legion this past week. Also, we had a little uh, get together up there, a little social gathering, uh, and um, met a lot of new people. A lot of new people, the veterans um, that uh, are members of the American Legion, and uh, them welcoming us there. It was. That was an awesome night in our... Uh, Came to find out they have a pretty good breakfast menu and lunch menu and it, Saturday menu with uh, steaks and, and the like. So yeah. well, what, what was that menu? Check it out. Like six bucks, right, for uh, six pork bucks, chop? Or? Six bucks for with pork chops, potatoes, and eggs. Yeah. It's not so bad. No, not so bad. <laughs> so when are you going to treat me? <laughs> oh, anytime. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, and don't forget, we also had a, a, a very successful fundraiser at the Ducet in wonderful... Attendance. In fact, it was interesting because, you know, typically after the the speeches given by the candidates, people would up and leave. But I don't think we got out of there before eleven p.m. Uh, nobody wanted to leave. <laughs> yeah, that that was really nice. And I and I think what it came down to was everybody just uh, enjoying the company of one another. Yeah. They're able to be there with one another. And I think also they were comparing notes. You know, the struggles and challenges that yeah. that the businesses had and uh, solutions for it and what they want to do and how they want to move forward. And uh, them being there at our fundraiser showed us that they want change and they want to continue to move forward with that. And, you know, that that turned out wonderful. Absolutely. Yeah. And this morning, I I know that uh, you were up since 3 a.m. getting ready for an event that uh, this morning that was sponsored by Marie Halloran and, and her husband and their organization. Yeah, that was the it was the 18th annual Life Works. Wow. Um, it ta- it's about uh, suicide, mm-hmm. um, talking about suicide and survivors, and you know um, w- I've been a part of that uh, for many years now, and uh, you know a lot of people that don't know that you know I I also suffered a, a tragic loss of uh, suicide in my family, and uh, it happened 44 years ago. Uh, you know how it is, right? Back then. You know, we don't talk about these things. Mm -hmm. And even amongst my siblings or when my parents were still around, you know, that's that's something that we don't talk about. And it wasn't just until um, last year that I came out and I spoke about my my brother's death uh, through suicide. So uh, it's, it's something that all those that attended felt some type of connection to one another because of the loss that they suffered and what are we doing to move forward? A, a very good question came up also, and uh, she she was mentioning about what are we doing for survivors, mm-hmm. and what are we doing for those? And what are what is the government agencies doing? Because she went to different places and she couldn't find assistance, and so I think 
that that's a subject that we also need to look into and how is it that we can give those services to to our families locally that uh, suffer a loss through through suicide and you know those that um, that um <coughs> survive suicide the the help that they need as well uh to to move on with life and to do what they can to help and assist others and it was uh yep yeah, it was a very very uh uh touching and uh, heartfelt uh event this morning we had a little candlelight ceremony and then uh, we had a little walk in memory of all those that uh, we lost and tonight we have our 30th anniversary for the Lions Club International District 204 mm. that Annette and I will be going to. And I understand that you're going to be going where? Uh, well, jo not, Joanne and I, we have to split duties, right, tonight. Yeah. So uh, Joanne and I will be attending the Chamber of Commerce. I believe they have a gala event. Yeah. So so we we got two busy events uh, going on tonight. Mm -hmm. And tomorrow, I... Well, I do want to share, though, that last night was a very special uh, event for us. Why we began by... Uh, Celebrating my mom's 90th, 94th birthday. Happy birthday, Auntie Lou. Auntie Lou, uh, also known as Auntie Duty, mm -hmm. And um, started off with Mass at 11 a.m. at St. Anthony's. It was supposed to be a, a time of rest for her at home until the evening celebration. But I understand she had so many visitors coming by the house to say and wish her well and pray with her that... Um, she got a little bit tired and, and was late to the celebration birthday party we had at Mescla. It was a private event with just our family because when you add my siblings and our, our spouses and children and grandchildren and for my mom, great-grandchildren, it was quite quite a crowd. <laughs> um, but what a blessing that uh, she's been able to live that long. And um, Yeah, so we also had a brother of mine, uh, Rick, and, and his wife, Jenny, fly in from from uh, Virginia, mm -hmm. and they were able to join us uh, from the airport right to the celebration. So, yeah, it, it's it's so interesting in, in how we we had that celebration of life, and then you had, you know, attended an event that, that dealt with the other end of the spectrum. Yeah. And uh, both events very heartfelt, but that's part of life, yeah. The circle of life. We're going to get right into the questions. Um, okay. I believe that we had uh, a couple of questions that came in from the Guam Federation of Teachers, and we can go ahead and have Ty uh, read them out, and we'll try and knock them out as soon as, or as much as we can. A lot of, uh, a lot of key events today, so we still have the <laughs> social media side, but we have about five questions that came in that are going to be answered. Employees and the residents of Guam deal with dilapidated buildings, schools, Mates, restrooms at parks, non-functional pools, prisons, and old equipment at the park, such as court cranes, police officer safety equipment, and fire equipment that cause unsafe working conditions. What have you done under your tenure to address these deficiencies? What are your plans to resolve and fund the ongoing issues of maintaining and building, if necessary, new facilities? Gov. I believe that under your first stint as governor that uh, you addressed a lot of issues during your term, not mm -hmm. just in maintaining but also building new uh, new facilities. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it was a very difficult time then uh, when I stepped into office. Of course, we were struggling from the aftermath of two successive storms, one in July, which was Chata'an, and then in, de in December 8th, which is Pong Sanwa. So our schools were damaged the hospital was damaged we had even tents in the parking lot of gmh the mayors got involved many of the homes that were um i guess not not of concrete construction may have had tin roofs and others uh, may be considered substandard were destroyed and uh the homeless situation was greatly exacerbated at that point in time and um and then of course we had challenges with the attorney general and our desire to go out and finance and build. Certainly we had help from FEMA, but we had to begin to think outside the box. And uh, it was at that point in time that we began to, first of all, repair existing classrooms. I think we built about 111 classrooms mm -hmm. in the various schools around the island, in, 
inclusive of DYA to get the schools up and running. The, um, and then we were able to, to, to talk to the Department of Interior and say, look, we've got compact impact money. And I, my, my argument was you've allowed the governor's discretion to use that money at, at, at their discretion with their pet projects. I'd like to put that into brick and mortar. And they said, well, what do you, what do you mean by that? And I said, well, we've had, um, if, this is, if this is to use to offset the, the impact of migration from the freely associated states into Guam and other, and other countries that come into Guam, Look at the demographics of what's happening with migration and the number of children at the elementary, at the middle school and high school coming into our island. We need to build schools. And, and so with that, they approved the use of it. Now that we had a, a, an approved source of funding, we went and, and worked. I, I believe I worked with the legislature, particularly Senator Larry Casper Bauer, mm -hmm. and began to take a look at what is the what is the master plan for Department of Education? And remember that time, it was very difficult because you had a newly elected Board of Education. You had a newly appointed superintendent by the board. And so they had their own mindset of how they were going to run things. But in cooperation with them and, and established where are the necessary schools that have to be built based on demographics and, and based on need and based on the condition, we were able to, to then identify certain sites uh, with Chamorro Land Trust properties, get that cleared out. We even had to move certain uh, people that were were basically squatting, right. using it, uh, whether it was their own arendu or pig farm or whatever the case may be. Atacal comes to mind. That was a very difficult, contentious situation where the, um, the person or the group that was there did not want to leave, and we really had to work with them. But we finally got their cooperation as they understood it's for the children. But using that um, municipal lease program, they then would come in and design, build, maintain the schools, and then, and then the government would take over after 20 years using uh, the funding source we had. And so we were able to build, um, gosh, we did Ukadu High School. Mm -hmm. We built New Liguan uh, Elementary School. We built uh, Atacao, and I believe we bu built Machinano. And then the legislature got involved, of course, and and they they wanted to build JFK, so we be, began the process. But had to that had to uh, deal with a different uh, financing source by going into the bond market, and I think it cost a hundred million at that time. And so it it kind of complicated things when the legislature got involved, but we still went with it, and and uh, Governor Eddie Calvo was able to cut the ribbon. We also went up to Tizen, and uh, working out with Cortec there, we we agreed to lease the property. And develop that as a transition right. school. We moved the JFK students that were displaced, <clears throat> moved them out of uh, GW back into uh, the Tijin location. And, and then when JFK was built, they, they transitioned out. We also did that, I believe, for Antalan Middle School. So, so those are our ideas that we had in, in um, how to fund and build. But we were, I was also able to build uh, together with Kaleo Monin and, and uh, Dr. Mike Cruz as Lieutenant Governor's fire stations, senior citizen centers, student resource centers, uh, boat ramps, public parks, and other recreational facilities to include the Dededo Sports Complex. Um, and that group under the Guam Football Association mm -hmm. working with FIFA and the government providing the land, and it worked out tremendous. Look at what we have there. We built uh, also the baseball fields that are there. We built the, the pool for the children, and we built the skate park also across the street, and we also built a walking path. And so when in, elected into office, I think, Tony, you and I are committed to build and expand our island schools. There has to be an assessment throughout of all, all, right. the, infra all the structures to determine what needs to be done. And, um, and also take a look at GovGuam. Um, look at the best number or options to finance and construct and modernize our schools and other government facilities, and again, using public-private partnerships as a vehicle. And so we are going to prioritize um, school facility, the master plan with Department of Education, or GDOE, and look at a five-year, 10-year, 15-year, so short-term, mid-term, long-term uh, strategic plans and other facilities uh, within GovGuam and their agencies. And I think that's how it works out yeah. perfectly is this public-private partnership 
where we get the the the, the private sector involved in in uh, helping us to formulate and also move forward with these these type of projects. Right. And I know that you did those schools almost twenty years ago or twenty years ago. Right. And those those will be reverting back to the government of Guam. So I think yeah. you know they need to be proactive at this point in time on the maintenance now of those those schools that are reverting back to Guam. Maintenance and upkeep. Exactly. Absolutely. So that's that's another another um, uh, issue that needs to be dealt with. Mm -hmm. And when we looked in the media uh, this past week about closures of school, uh, Oceanville Middle School, FBLG, all the issues that are now coming up about our, our school, mm -hmm. I think what um, perhaps if you agree with me that the Department of Education needs to look at getting a CMT uh, team, a construction management team, involved in this process way before they put any bids out so that they can actually go through and assess the schools and assess what's going on mm -hmm. so that they can look out for the best interest of the government and Department of Education and saying, hey, wait a minute, uh, what did you say that was going to cost? No, that's not, you know. And I think that's the importance of getting uh, uh, a CMT uh, mm -hmm. a team involved early on. And uh, hopefully that that's what they look at when we... Yeah, it's always wise that you, you know you can't you can't make plans and and um, and and begin the process of building an, unless you calculate the cost. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can lay the foundation, but if you don't have the funds to com bring it to completion, you know it's it uh, there'll be a lot of, it'll it'll be a mockery, and and so we have to be very smart and diligent about it. Also recognizing that there are other uh, federal funds out there. There's housing and urban development. There's a community development block grants, right. um, you know, and there's FEMA, Federal Emergency Management uh, Agency funds that uh, can help, I guess, strengthen our, our facilities in, in, the, in the event of um, typhoons and other, other natural disa disasters that come our way. And so I think it's also with equipment and um, uh, vehicles and equipment to where mm -hmm. we start looking at having them uh, – have a maintenance contract with them. So if we purchase vehicles, it has to come with a maintenance contract. Or if we lease vehicles, it comes with a maintenance contract. Mm -hmm. Equipment that we've purchased should come with a warranty, you know, for a couple of three, three-year warranty or something like that so that uh, we don't have to worry about these issues on short-term and they lo they're out for long-term uh, uh, care. And that way, True. every three to five years, perhaps replaced or, or repaired. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. Next question. The government of Guam spends millions each year on renting facilities around the island. Addressing this issue has the potential to create a revenue to string to address the government facilities in disrepair. What are your plans in your capacity as governor once elected to reduce the rental costs of the government? Yeah, again, um, you can recall the old Department of Administration building that was torn down. Of course, it had been there for well over 50 years. Uh, and then many of the agencies that moved in into other private facilities. The Guam legislature, as an example of how it, it did take a while, but they eventually went back and uh, took that historic building of the Guam legislature, expanded it to, to um, establish uh, the operations of the legislature, right, as you know. But uh, where they were, even my in my time as a senator, we were always in that building near Holale. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I when I thought about it, it was like the landlord was very fortunate there in <laughs> that uh, the the Guam legislature basically paid for that mortgage for the life of Ten it. Ten times over. Yeah, many times <laughs> over. It was extremely <laughs> lucrative, yeah. and and certainly you know this uh, government having the government of Guam as a tenant in any a publicly or privately owned facility is a good revenue source for the, the landlord. But uh, we do need to take a look at facilities within the government that makes logical sense as to where they ought to be placed and and finding the uh, the finances or, of course, the monies to, to build and place them in there. Uh, yeah. I know that you're well aware, Senator, of certain um, yeah, I believe, agencies. Yeah, uh, a couple of years ago... Um Senator Duenas introduced legislation that would have the mm -hmm. Department of Land Management. There's a piece of government land right there by Hulalis again and uh, that is government-owned and to build a 
land management building. And I guess the concept of it was to have land management on the top, and then you'd be able to have you know uh, stores on the bottom or uh, uh, commercial retail down there. So it wasn't be- Senator. Wasn't that also inclusive of um, perhaps? Um, merging also ancestral lands into and that same land. facility. Exactly. Yeah. So we all have the three the three agencies into one building, mm-hmm. and um, it's still <laughs> I, I'm not sure where that's at right now, but uh, hopefully it'd be able to move forward uh, soon so that uh, you know maybe we can we can inch that forward again and you know actually make it come to fruition so that we can get them out of uh, leasing and get them into their own facility. And it comes to uh, a perfect uh, uh, example again. Headquarters for the Guam Police Department. Mm-hmm. We still don't have one. You know, I believe that uh, a piece of property was uh, identified, and as to why they're not moving forward and building a headquarters for the police department, I, I yeah, this past four years, I'm not sure why they haven't uh, even discussed building it. And I think that uh, you know, our, our men and women in blue are just like. You know, they keep moving us from there to there, and we're in season. It's a, still a temporary home. They need a home of their own, and I'm sure under our, our administration that we're going to move forward and, you know, get that home for them. So that I believe with in, a, in my time with GPD, it was actually up at the old Naval Air Station, NAS, and the lands reverted back to Guam, and uh, GPD had moved into that, one of those buildings there. It was actually old next to the old swimming pool oh, area, right. a two-story complex and uh, eventually, and so we, we had to renovate that, and and, and uh, they operated out of that. But they were very dire um, uh, situations. Revan Tax was also in another complex, and I recall with the storm that came and the water damage, the buildup of mold and, and everything else, we had to move them out there for their own safety and eventually rented the property up there by uh, Lower Barragata Heights, right. where they're currently at. But So there have been opportunities in the past uh, where we, we saw a need to move out of a, an old government building and, and, and put them in a, in a better environment in the short term and midterm. But long term, we, we do need to do an assessment of crunch the numbers and look at what is the best alternative. The, the current situation with the shortage of labor in construction, mm-hmm. the um, rising cost of, of materials, uh, building materials exa- uh, are... are Many of the challenges that we face, and in talking to some contractors, they say we can bid on a certain project at, 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 at this time, but as delays occur in government permitting and, and all the other requirements, once they break ground, uh, keeping within that budget, even, even factoring in their profit margins are quickly eaten up. So uh, very interesting times ahead if we're going to move in this direction. And I think that we also need to look at uh, getting the, the, the process streamlined and cutting a lot of this red tape in, in the permitting process. Mm-hmm. Um, example, McDonald's, I think, had to wait almost a year just to get a permit to renovate. And, you know, there's others out there. And if we're inviting people in to invest into our island and to build and, and you know, put hundreds of millions of dollars here only to meet with delays and mm-hmm. bureaucratic red tape, then, you know, they may just move somewhere else, and that's yeah, let's a process that we need to really look at. So let, let's look at the um, public health facility up in Mangilao that suffered a, um, a fire, and I believe the source of it was electrical right. short shortages that that caused it to. It's a it's an old building, um, historic in, in some sense, but uh, what can we do? A, an assessment must be done to see if we can repair that. We take a look at the northern and the southern community health centers. We need to improve these. Uh, I know that there's a lot of concern about about that situation up there. And, of course, it leads into the hospital. But there are assessments that needs to be done. And, and again, determining what is the best soar, uh, best approach in repairing these facilities. You know, I, yeah. uh, a while back I introduced a piece of legislation that would uh, provide for a study to see what our – Northern and our southern health care centers can actually be like an urgent care center. Mm-hmm. So those that need emergency um, assistance or, you know, medical assistance and with late night hours that they didn't have to drive all the way up to GMH, that they'd be able to go right there at the southern health clinic or the northern health clinic. And, mm-hmm. uh, but that, that wasn't able to uh, 
passed, so, you know, it's okay. We continue to drive on, and we do what we can to incru- uh, improve our heart health care facilities and, uh, you know, uh, what we can to make All things right. better for our island. Thank you. The wages of government and private sector employees have historically lagged behind their national counterparts. This creates an environment where people leave Guam to pursue a better life elsewhere. Most private sector employees rely on Social Security for their retirement, and the new Government of Guam Retirement Plan is a paltry 401k equivalent with up to 5% matching. What have you done and what will you do in your role as governor to offer a competitive salary for government employees and to foster an environment where private businesses will prioritize an increase in wages and salaries? What plan do you have to ensure that public and private employees can retire with a decent safety net? You know, it's interesting. There was a um, an article I read in the Washington Post, and it, it talked about the the brain drain and and the trend of reducing populations in the U.S. territories. And it and it stated that in the starting in the 1960s. Oh, there we go. There we go. Yeah, so it, it, it talked about that uh, starting in the 1960s um, and even earlier, U.S. and uh, territorial officers used aggressive tax incentives to lure factories and other types of uh, industries. It worked where global industries reshaped the islands. It talked about Puerto Rico, where there were textile uh, pharmaceutical factories in Puerto Rico. And in the Northern Marianas, I think we're all aware, aware of the textile uh, factories that were there in Virgin Islands. It was oil refineries. Even Guam, we had Guam Oil Refinery Co- Company, Gorco, as it was called. And in American Samoa, you had the tuna packing industry. But um, then, of course, the politicians got involved uh, in Washington, and um, they began to crack down on what they called corporate welfare during the Clinton administration. And the years that followed most of those tax breaks disappeared, and the most prominent of them expired just as it says the Chinese factories were hitting their stride. And, um, and, and, and so what happened is the islands and the manufacturers and these industries depended on these tax breaks, and they couldn't weather the storm of the, of the competition coming out of China. And so what, what happened is, um, you know, from, from 1996 to t- 2006, uh, it, it explains where there was a massive decline in the in these industries in Puerto Rico in the in the nor- northern Marianas. Guam even had a watch manufacturer that was here, and we had a small bit of um, of textile that that left because of these the elimination of Section 936, as they call it. So these economic struggles have acerbated and it, it accelerated the brain the brain drain. On, on the islands as the young and ambitious leave to attend school or join the U.S. military. And similar to the states where rural kids would be seeking their fortunes in cities, the islanders often put down roots in the mainland where their college degrees or experiences, mm-hmm. even coming uh, out of uh, military, uh, retiring there and they're, they're raising their families, they find it more remunerative, and, and the islands just don't have many high-paying opportunities, is what the article says, for the educated. And, uh, and so it says it's really troubling for our middle class students and graduates here. That was a re- remo- uh, Roseanne Jones talking about that. So it's very challenging. They say the families are leaving because they find it challenging to, um, very challenging place on the islands to economically build and raise a family and to commit to. And so the exodus of our Best and brightest continues to make the islands less attractive for even others, uh, I guess, industries thinking about coming into Guam. The um, It's been a downward spiral, but I think one thing unique to the islands uh, like Guam is because of the FAS uh, compact agreements with the United States. Although we've had um, many of our students leaving, either joining the military or for school, um, the population has not necessarily decreased on Guam because we have immigration from the freely associated right. states into our island. But, uh, but we do have, um, there are many thousands of, of, of higher paying jobs and skilled labor jobs on Guam. 
that are currently being filled by off-island workers from the U.S. and the Philippines and other countries. So uh, we just have to get our people trained to take some of these higher-paying, skilled labor jobs. And, of course, more can be done to help our local residents acquire these skill sets for these jobs. Right. Senator? And, and, you know, even even with the Guam, I believe um, it was perhaps back in your time, Doug, that uh, with the hay pay, right, the, yeah. the hay study that you mm -hmm. uh, you worked with the hay study. And when, when we start talking now about government pay and when we look at what happened just several weeks ago on the, yeah. the teacher pay raises, mm -hmm. right, where now – the administration, what this administration has done is actually piecemeal. Started taking different sectors of, okay, we'll, we'll give teachers pay raise. Okay, we'll give uh, um, law enforcement. Okay, we'll give. But I believe the concept of the hay pay plan was to do a, com a complete government-wide across-the-board pay study and implementation. Uh, am I correct on that? Yes. Uh, if, you, if I may um – Again, if you don't learn the hist the lessons from history, you're likely to repeat them again. And I see we've come full circle. What we did at back then under the direction of Governor Joseph Atta, I was the executive director at Civil Service Commission then. And uh, we had just come off a, a lawsuit and a settlement, and it was called 5440. Mm -hmm. And what they did was they gave a pay raise based on the rate of inflation from one point to the other and came up with that figure and gave it across the board. Um, and it, what it did was it, it took the, uh, the, uh, the lower paying jobs and, and uh, raised them up by a large percentage. And there was very li little movement at the top end, so it really compressed the pay grades. The system was always also based upon what was called a comparative pay scale. Mm -hmm. So, for example, they would take a nurse and say a nurse is similar in um, the level of, of skill and, and education requirements and with a teacher. And so they were, would always um, they would always have to comp uh, basically equate these two. It, it resulted from a, um, what happened was that you had a school health counselor, which is basically a nurse qualification uh, or qualified position that said, well, if you gave the teachers a raise, then I, as a nurse, uh, I'm also going to sue the government of Guam for inequity in pay. And that's what started everything. So we went with um, what's called the Hay Study, and it, it changed the entire methodology of taking each position based on your duties and responsibilities. And, and we had to conduct desk audits throughout the government of Guam right. for every single position. Uh, not only that, we had to eliminate positions that were no longer uh, viable, like they had keyhole punchers and, <laughs> and the like, that we just had to clean up um, all the position descriptions in government and classification. And based on that, it was a unified pay scale. In fact, Senator, we were able to get even all three branches of government, executive, legislative, and judicial branches together, saying secretaries at this level, this is the pay. Because if you worked for an autonomous agency, more than likely you were, you were um, getting paid higher mm -hmm. than a secretary uh, within the line agencies. If you worked at the court, you probably, um, depending on the position, also got paid more so than, than other positions in the government, uh, for example, the attorney general's office. And so we came up with a unified pay plan that was based on a weighted system and uh, – and then, of course, it began to fall apart mm -hmm. when the Guam legislature got, got involved. involved again right. by giving pay raises. And the first instance was um, the court marshals. And so the argument was that they had to equate the court marshals with the Guam Police Department officers, GPD officers. And that began to – once you had a crack in the unified plan – it began. It, it it just um, it cracked further, and time and time and time again, you would see now, now the legislature crumbling. or the governor coming in uh, currently with executive orders, right? And uh, and now you've got everyone scrambling and arguing for equity and pay because they're using a comparison or comparative type basis versus the weighted system on 
the duties and responsibilities of the job and what they ought to pay. And then you, you, you couple that with what can the government pay mm-hmm. um, with, a, with a, an economy of our size and the tax base that we have. It was determined by a, a study that this government of Guam gives away more uh, in the way of tax breaks than most other jurisdictions. And so um, how do we then provide for adequate compensation with the current tax base and revenue base that we have? So there's a lot of factors involved. Yeah, but that's, um, that's something that we're going to have to re-examine yeah. again and when we get in there and uh, look at it and take it from ground zero once again. Right. And, you know, uh, and we need to because if we're going to uh, um, effectively compete against a global market for the uh, the talent and skill sets skill that we set. need on Guam, that must be yeah. part of the solution. Okay. Thank you, though, for that. Thank you. The housing prices skyrocketed, skyrocketed, and it remains beyond reach for individuals starting a family. In addition, homelessness appears to be on the rise. How will you address the lack of housing inventory and homelessness? Well, um, one thing we did in my time was we we took advantage of a federal program. It was called the LIHTC, or Low Income Housing Tax Credit. And um, these credits were assigned to each of the insular territories. No one had taken advantage of it. And so, again, working with the legislature and working with um, private sector, we were able to... And we'll be right back. All too often, governments do too little in some areas, but too much in others. The Camacho Ada team wants GovGuam to provide basic services and otherwise stay out of people's lives. Government overreach will not happen in a Camacho Ada administration. And they believe in three co-equal branches of government, not having one exert power over the others. For more on Felix and Tony's plans for government services, visit CamachoAdaForGuam.com. I'm Felix Camacho, and I approve this message. And now, back on the trail with Felix and Tony to have these investors come in and provide the funding where they would then build. And the idea was, how do we get individuals out of rental units and make them become homeowners? And so building a three-bedroom, four-bedroom type uh, house, and in these days now they even have townhouses, where they would come in at a fixed rate of seven fifty, eight fifty a month over 15 years. The incentive was if you take care of this of this unit if you stay and maintain here for 15 years once the tax credit uh, period has been has lapsed you have an opportunity then to become a homeowner buying it at the market rate or price 15 years ago wow because the the investor then made all their money and their profit and so it took renters and and now are are turning them into homeowners and, and with that also, it was able to provide for uh, senior citizen housing and lower income housing too. Uh, a- a- and so that was w- one of the first approaches we took. There are um, many challenges, of course, nowadays because what's happened is, although we have, we've um, in s- to some extent addressed the low income, the middle income uh, sector is is w- where they're really hurting because they they um their income level if you have mom and dad both working or the, uh, one of them may have a, a two job salary uh, combined they don't qualify because they exceed the threshold yet they don't qualify for the loans that they need to build uh, or to purchase because they don't make enough money and so you've got that one gap that we do need to take care of and address and find ways to deal with that. And then, of course, we have the, the, um, those that are now homeless. Uh, we have noticed living in Tamuning, there are, of course, many intersections. And in talking with the mayor, she says, yes, we have identified new individuals that are f- being flown in with a one-way ticket to Guam. And they're, they're, they're coming into my office, the office of the mayor, to establish a mailing address using the mayor's office as the address so that they can then receive mail and establish some form of residency or whatever the case may be. And, and so that's how we've been able to notice that 
you have individuals now coming in from other jurisdictions outside of Guam. It could be Hawaii. It could be the West Coast coming to Guam. The weather's good. You can practically go to any um, any church or any other um, place, and, and you or you find a place. People are generous here. They mm-hmm. would give you food. There are many others out there. And so we've got them. We've got the individuals that are dealing with drugs. You have individuals that are or are, are drug addicted and are suffering from that. We have individuals that have criminal records and others that are just out there because they've been rejected by their families. And so it is a, a very big socioeconomic um, and, um, issue that we need to tackle. Yeah. You know. And I think uh, when you look at what we have today, we have um, housing, housing, affordable housing, but now we need to look at what we can do to make housing affordable. You know, home ownership affordable, and I think that's where, you know, working with, uh, you know, Department of Labor, because when we look at what construction costs now, it's mm-hmm. it's it's really gone gone up, and yeah. even with uh, rental, uh, and I think a part of that is the uh, what they get from military renters, you know, because they have their overseas housing allowance yeah. that allows them to you know rent at a higher uh, higher uh, Mm-hmm. bracket than what locals can rent and you know you, you can't blame the homeowner or the you know about uh, renting to military but I think we need to find that that medium there where we can say you know how is it that we can how how is it that we can continue to accommodate the military renters but at the same token um, ensure our people are not left out yeah and so uh, again oh, I, I, I we are going to have to prioritize um, housing we are going to have to look at um, some of the federal policies out there and push to engage the U.S. Department of Agriculture um, to seek designation of Guam as a sub- substantially underserved trust territory. Mm-hmm. They call it SUTA, to provide much-needed tools to the island residents to help finance um, improvements in their electric, telecommunications, water, and sewer infrastructure for Guam, mm-hmm. the government of Guam. Um, we also are, are looking at ways to provide allow for private sector investment into local affordable housing projects. And um, one thing we certainly want to do is take our Chamorro Land Trust properties and others um, and, and get them properly um, surveyed. Mm-hmm. There's a, a long waiting list of several thousands out there. Get those lands um, properly surveyed and marked and, and distributed. And then we've got to find ways of dealing with the infrastructure Water that has to power. go in. Yeah, because sadly, you, you've seen projects, um, for example, at Zero Down, Gil Baza, Gil Breeze, I mean, three subdivisions under that were privately owned, and it was a, some kind of a scheme to get the people to buy the land, and, but uh, the, the, the infrastructure was never put in place. Uh, little by little, it's getting up there, but we do need to focus in on these existing areas where many of our, our people are living mm-hmm. and address not only that which exists, but Look at what's happening again with tomorrow land trust landowners, yeah. and you know no no one should yeah. live without the basic necessities. Correct, water and power. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, this is the last question from the GFT. People with Chamorro lineage and other residents of Guam have not voted for the island's political status in many years. Other than action by Congress to adopt the Organic Act. Our political status with the United States has not changed since Spain ceded Guam in 1898. With 2022 coming to an end, what actionable timelines do you have in mind to resolve the years of inaction? Well, I know that the government of Guam um, has a commission on decolonization. It was established by law, public law. Mm -hmm. Uh, And there have been attempts, I think back in the 70s, I remember I was probably uh, in high school then or, or in college, that um, they had a constitutional convention, mm-hmm. right? We've had that right. in the past. So there have been certain attempts at, um, at political status. And, and perhaps um, it is a time now that a political status vote will come in full cooperation with the Guam Election Commission to see if that can be funded and, and see if there's an approach there and work with them to consider this important choice for Guam residents as we work towards a, a status vote during our time in office. Um, 
Yeah. So we do need to. Senator? Yeah, I, I remember when uh, Governor Calvo tried to uh, do a plebiscite vote, right, you know, to to um, move forward with it. And, you know, just the, the roadblocks and the obstacles. Um, you know, even when we <coughs> – I went back to – to uh, New York to the United Nations, and I was with uh, then uh, Speaker uh, Judy Wampat, and we were visiting the different island nations' uh, offices that were there in New York, and they said, you know what, it's a difficult time for you guys to try and uh, move your political status forward because the United States, you know, has that, that power over not just you guys, but also the, the outer islands, right, mm -hmm. where they say, well, when it comes to a vote, you know, we got to you got they start lobbying the the FSM and uh, those others, you know, to to stay with the the U.S.'s vote on how they move forward. Mm -hmm. And um, they said, what you need to do is you need to work with the uh, Office of Insular Affairs and you know, go with that route and see what you guys can can get out of there. Because four years ago, I I, I even told the I think it was the great debate or one of the debates that we had that all we're doing is. We, we just keep running in circles, and eventually we need to get out of that circle and and come forward and, and do something with with this, um, yeah. you know, the status to, you know, get it. I, I, if we're going to stay in the, the current uh, status that we're in or if, you know, whatever one of the other statuses that are out there, because the, they, they have the uh, independent statehood and free, free association, right? And status quo. Yeah, and status mm -hmm. quo. So, you know, hopefully – Something will come out of it. And timelines, we've been in this for the past 30, 40 yeah. years, and I, I don't think it's going to get resolved in, in the next four, eight, or even ten years. Um, we can work at it. We can chip at it. But to actually come to a, a resolution to it, it's, it's, it's going to be perhaps not in my lifetime. So, you know, and I think we, we all recognize, of course, that our, our status is, is granted to us by Congress. Mm -hmm. And... Um, you know, it's, it, and the, the whole argument of Guam uh, or the United States, is it, is it really truly a democracy or have we forgotten the fact that we are a republic? Um, so you can live on Guam, but once you get on a plane and land in California or even the state of Hawaii, you step off the plane, that all changes. You mm -hmm. now have the right to vote. You know, you, you're fully incorporated. And once you establish residency, even more so. And so um, there are certain realities that we have to face. And I often think about, like my brother who just returned um, have, after having lived, lived uh, in the U.S. for maybe 20, 25 years now with his family, raising them there in the state of Virginia, here to visit my mom for a birthday. But, you know, I look at their children and, and the opportunities that they have for education and careers and um, many that have left Guam in the military to eventually settle. And uh, once they're once they get out of the military, they they raise their families. Uh, so, what does it take for Guam to be fully incorporated into becoming a, a full fledged American citizen, but also recognize the advantages that we have, um, the federal taxes that come, the fact that we don't pay <laughs> federal, federal taxes, taxes. <laughs> and um, and as a territory, the amount of monies we we receive, um, you know, the Section Thirty monies that right. the states don't receive the compact impact funding and so i believe it that we must always advocate to to be uh, more fully incorporated and and of course rep uh, recognize our advantages of being part of uh, what is still considered the greatest nation in the world mm -hmm. and the opportunities it takes for us even as families are leaving because they can't make a living on guam or they're ambitious and they want to pursue other opportunities with their skill sets because we are part of the United States, they're able to get on a plane and go. Right now, you got thousands. I think they're, they've estimated in the United States, two million have come across the southern border seeking a better life, coming from 130 different countries from around the world, you know, <laughs> trying to get into the United States. Does it make sense that at this point in time that we want to get out? But that's for the people to decide. These are the, the, the longstanding questions that, our generation or those um, that will follow us will have to decide on. Mm -hmm. But uh, for now, we must continue to advocate for the people of Guam to get further recognition and inclusion and acceptance as citizens of the United States of America. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Thank you.
I think that's all the questions from the GSC. Yep. Yeah. So moving over to our social media, and I apologize <coughs> in advance if I butcher these usernames. Uh, the first one comes from As Digest Pinata. There's two questions here. I'll read the first one. Why aren't we concerned about public safety on our roads in which our people drive on every day? Well, that, uh, that's an ongoing issue that uh, continuously uh, happens. That I think public works has come to a point where they really need to start looking at how we can keep road maintenance up to par and not wait until, you know, we have a eight inch pothole that's uh, there on, on the road, you know. We, it's, it's about being more proactive that, you know, we get a, a hotline that if someone can call in and said, you know, there's a pothole on this road here. And, you know, we have a, a team that goes out there, you know, and just covers these holes and then start looking and, and uh, marking them so that we can actually go out there and, uh, not just do a Band-Aid fix, but cut them out and then resurface and, uh, and, and repair that, that surface of road that, that needs it. And there's quite a bit of roads here on the island. I mean, when you go from Pago Bay down, like uh, from the, the tri, uh, uh, tri intersection there in, in Chalon Pago down towards Pago Bay, that one road is just very rippled. Mm -hmm. That should actually be uh, just cut out and then, you know, resurface so that, the people don't have to worry about, you know, uh, bouncing all over the place and then inadvertently going into the oncoming traffic. But that's what they can do is, you know, have a uh, a team that's uh, that's ready to just do these quick repairs and uh, and patches, and then public works can go out and start, mm -hmm. you know, I bet or they they source out the uh, the contract to do repairs immediately. Yeah, I. In my time, I know that we uh, had completed with Federal Highway Administration the 2030 Federal Highway Master Plan mm -hmm. and um, a commitment for several millions millions of dollars over the, over the years to to deal with our primary roads and of course our secondary roads. Uh, we also were able to find additional funding uh, where we were able to then work uh, with the village mayors. And I remember telling the mayors, "You have to tell us." It, because you represent your people in your in your village, what are the roads that need repair? You need to prioritize and not politicize it based on who voted for you or, or who didn't. But what are the roads that that are in most dire need? The secondary roads that need to be paved, and we've continued that pro that that process. I re I recall, um, you know, road paving and all these issues that always um, go back to even the days of Governor Paul Calvo. And uh, and of course, Carl Gutierrez uh, was well, well known for what he had done down in Agate, you know, mm -hmm. the RR Crew subdivision and uh, other other roads. Of course, not only bringing in roads, but uh, um, power poles, the concrete power poles. And in our time again, with the primary roads and working on secondary roads, so there is always concern. I do want to take a look at what's happening down at Public Works, because it, if, in my observation. Um, there is a firm, of course, that is, has been determined by um, Federal Highway, right. which is primarily run out of the district office in Honolulu. Mm -hmm. And so it seems as if Honolulu has more control over what's happening with the programs here on Guam and, uh, and how they are being managed. And even the engineering department within the within Department of Public Works has been pretty much taken over by a, a third-party firm, engineering firm, and there are pluses and minuses to that but I hear a lot of concerns about what's been ongoing and the the amount of money that's been made yeah. uh, from that and perhaps any conflict of interest of how mm -hmm. that private that, that private company has uh, gotten gotten the contract yeah so you know I think that's that's something that also needs to be looked into not just locally but also federally I mean yeah, yeah. if there is a conflict of interest that uh, that uh, awarded that company, the the the, uh, the contract then you know we really need to get to the bottom of that and work it out and you know sure. okay uh, thank you what was that other question the second question is what happens to the federal funds received during this administration after Camacho Ada takes Adaloop how do the current administration account for those funds and who pays for monies unaccounted for 
Well, as it relates to federal funds that apply to our roads, if that's what the question is referring to, then, you know, certainly, again, Federal Highway uh, Administration um, has a lot of say in, in how that goes, and it must, uh, again, uh, apply towards the the plans that have been laid out, primary and secondary roads. But as far as federal funds, I, I know, Senator, you guys have um, dealt a lot with this in, in uh, the budget process, and perhaps you can shed some light on this uh, topic. Right. So the uh, the administration says that you know we have no control over the, the ARP funding that has come in. Mm. It's that's all at the governor's discretion, and you know perhaps that may be true, but we can still hold people accountable for funds that are misappropriated or unaccounted for. And you know uh, the way that we can look into that is uh, mm -hmm. assisting the assistant, uh, having the assistance of the. Uh, the FBI or other agencies, federal agencies that need to be involved in uh, looking or any misconduct that may have been uh, been going on during during the pandemic time with federal funds. I think I think the people of Guam need to understand the um, the significance of what happened over the last three and a half years. But for government of Guam under ARP and other programs, the federal funds that have poured into our island as a result of um, Congressional action and the, you know, of course, the printing of trillions of dollars out of the Federal Reserve, mm -hmm. flooding um, the United States. The we've received in, in excess, I understand, of two billion, two billion dollars, mm -hmm. and there still remains. Uh, last I heard, is slightly under three hundred million still sitting in the Bank of Guam, mm -hmm. and so how that money was spent. And, of course, Gita was very much involved in that, the Department of Public Health, and, uh, of course, at the discretion and direction of the governor of Guam. Uh, it, it certainly warrants uh, investigation into, or at least uh, an analysis yeah. and an audit of where those monies went and what is unaccounted for, who, um, who are, have been recipients of it. And um, I think the procurement situation also requires a, a very thorough and complete audit, not only um, with government uh, agencies such as the public auditor, but, mm -hmm. but perhaps also including federal agencies right. because these are federal monies. Yeah. Yeah. And when you, know, when you look at CARES Act 1, CARES Act 2, ARP, infrastructure funding, I mean, mm -hmm. over $2 billion yes. just, just coming out to Guam. So, you know, uh, like they say, right, before you, before you pass the, the torch over, you know, we want to <laughs> see where everything is at because uh, we're going to see who's going to be holding the bag on that one. Yes, sir. <laughs> Our next question comes from Bonito, Bonita underscore Gunuki, and they ask, crime is high. Meth on island is cheap. Our island is no longer safe. What will you do about it? Well, certainly, um, her statement is true. Crime is high. Meth on island is cheap. Our island is no longer safe. Our people live in fear. And, yes, that's always been the question. What will you do about it? We, I think uh, what's been highlighted, first of all, is the lack of police officers out there. And we'll get to that and, and the need to hire and the process upon, what, upon which... Um, we go about that with Department of Administration and, and the like. But I want to just point to one thing uh, on a conversation I had with two individuals yesterday. Uh, one of them deals with um, with the court system and, and what's happening uh, to our youth in, in the drug courts and, and, and the like uh, and every everything else that's ongoing there, what's happening in the family situation. The other is on the treatment end of it. And the sad story I heard was, Meth babies, mm -hmm. so women that that uh, are addicted to meth, amphetamine or ice, and they have, you know, give birth to children that 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 then um, have that in their system, and the lack of resources, the lack of treatment, the lack of um, skilled individuals that are are necessary to to deal with them. Not only, not only in our um, mental health or behavioral health sciences uh, environment, but uh, in our social environment is, is really, really sad. The, uh, the fact that over the last two and a half years we had, we had meth, uh, I mean, we, we, we certainly were dealing with the shutdown of our 
government shutdown of our society, the children that were typically under DYA or court supervision, um, those programs were shut down. And, and with the re resumption of school coming on, you've had um, a lot of incidences now where they're having to deal with, with, um, with these individuals that did not have the treatment necessary. You have had um, many problems with the children also in families where the parents um, have not been able to handle it, and so they end up in foster care. Um, that also applies to meth. And so we do need to address the fact that it's cheap, which means that there's an abundance of, of meth and other drugs coming in on island. Uh, the concern is what's going to happen when fentanyl, if it's already, it's all probably already here now, and uh, and the impact that's going to have on our, upon our youth and our our community is going to be very severe. So, the you know the places of entry, whether it be at the port, whether it be at the airport, uh, the drug interdiction. How do we deal with it? How do we deal with the treatment of individuals, the incarceration of them? What do we do with them afterwards? Uh, what about the Again, those that are, are victims of it. Because every family um, has had to deal with it. Mm -hmm. And I know that they've used this politically against me, of course, and made it very personal. But um, the fact is, is that there is opportunity that if we can gather all our resources uh, as a community and talk about restoration of lives, not only prevention of, of, of drugs coming in and, and dealing with it on the streets, but how do we restore lives and make people whole where they can move on and get past uh, their, their past crimes or their failures or shortfalls, build a new life and, and restore uh, and, and go on to be living, contributing members of our community is, is what we need to. And so there's always been talk about doom and gloom, and we have to bring and speak life and bring hope and, and, uh, and bring prosperity back to this, this island. Get rid of the fear and, and make this and heal this land is, is really what's needed. And so it's going to require everybody getting involved in this. Yeah, and those that commit a crime and that they don't belong here, then, you know, they get sent back to where they came yeah, from. Exactly. Yeah. If we're and, interested and in that, that. And that's what, uh, you know, the, uh, the Cowboy administration has, has mm -hmm. done. And that's something that uh, we can also look into. Absolutely. This question comes from Grace Becoming. How will you turn the economy around for Guam? Is there hope? Uh, There's always hope. <laughs> oh, definitely. There's always hope in, on how to turn the economy around. Yeah. And uh, bringing in investors, I believe, Governor, is one of those that is uh, uh, important to rebuilding our economy. And in order to attract investors and um, bring them to our island, we need to cut the bureaucratic red tape on the permitting process and the business license process and the occupancy process, permitting process. So all those things need to be streamlined and all those things that we need to look at so that we can get them to, you know, invest and say, you know, we're going to help you guys uh, with your economy. We're going to help you guys move forward. But, you know, we, <laughs> we, we need to make sure that, you know, th there's a process there in place that is not going to have us wait three and a half years before, you know, we're able to turn a turn a, a shovel over to to break ground on on a project. Right, and y you know, our economy has always been uh, a three three legged economy. It was based on the, the pillar of tourism, based on the tours, uh, the pillar of uh, the service industry, mm -hmm. and of course the military and all the federal dollars that pour into our island, both from DOD and other uh, federal uh, grants and, and the like, and so. We need to go back to basics, as we've talked to people in the industry saying, you've got to help us get back um, and build our tourism industry, which has always been very sensitive and, 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 um, and reactive to anything that's happening locally and globally. We've been through this before. And so working with the tourism industry to rebuild that one uh, key component of our economy is absolutely necessary. Getting out beyond Guam, improving our, our, our product, and, and working to restore our island um, all that we have, our, our environment, of course, our parks, bringing back safety and making Guam a, a great place, getting the re retail industry back and, uh, and dealing with it. And then, of course, as you mentioned, getting investors back in here. 
but getting back to basics. And then, of course, looking at what's happening over the next decade with the military expansion and buildup, there's so many opportunities there uh, for our local people to get gainfully employed. In talking with somebody in the uh, construction industry, they said, if we, if we had people that are willing to work what they call under-the-sun type mm -hmm. jobs, which would include iron work, which would uh, include carpentry and masonry, in those three areas, uh, they've had to import labor. And, and so what can we do in working again with our youth? How do we find uh, and prevent or present to them opportunities where they can see that there is an, a career here? And, um, and of course, um, when we look at our National Guard, we look at our reserves, uh, they're a key component, again, to our community. So we have to work collaboratively also with the Nor Northern Marianas and with the freely associated states of, um, of Palau, of, um, of, of course, of uh, the islands in Chuk and Pompeii and Kushrai, the Marshall Islands, and uh, look to our neighbors in the east or rather west of us, which is Asia. Mm -hmm. We are in a really amazing area. So there are many global economic factors that are, are happening, uh, and, and uh, we're going to see a season of change that's happening globally, but um, being able to adjust to it and, and maintaining our, our relationship, of course, with the United States and tying in with that all that we can uh, to benefit our people is, is absolutely critical in this time. Oh, great. That's, uh, that's great to hear. And, you know, we'll, with that last, uh, that last question and, you know, answering that, uh, it's going to bring us down to our B-roll. All right. <laughs> as we, as we, uh, Close up this episode of uh, On the Trail with Felix and Tony. Uh, our questions on the trail come from our social media, and we encourage everyone to send in your questions. And, you know, uh, it's at the Camacho Ara for Guam. And you can also engage us on our social media platforms on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Your questions can be sent to us in text, audio, or video. And we this day, we still haven't gotten a video or audio uh, question. I'm looking forward to that. Uh, we look forward to you engaging with you in the digital space and answering your questions on the show. There's only, is there 51 days left to the general election? General? Perhaps less. Less than that, <laughs> right. Uh, you can still register to vote by going online to gec.guam.gov reg backslash register, or you can visit the Guam Election Commission office at the Oka Building in Timuning. Or by calling our headquarters at 671-475-2222, and we can get a registrar to uh, register you. Early voting begins on October 10th and ends on November 3rd. Our, our upcoming weeks, uh, our upcoming events this week, we got the, what do we got? <laughs> we got a lot of things going on. I I got session going on. So. You have session. and uh, yeah, I, You got a lot of visits with the, uh, uh, private businesses that uh, are been going uh, really well. Yes. And, uh, you know, I think that the response from that is just tremendous. And it just goes to show that, you know, we're getting into the into the grassroots and not just with our people, but also the grassroots and the, the businesses that are have been hurting mm -hmm. throughout this pandemic and their concerns. So, you know, we look forward to everyone. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to... Uh, Engage in our next uh, podcast, and uh, we look forward to seeing you then. Yes, uh, I'd just like to close by saying, you know, as we go about and meet people in the community, there is so much optimism. There's so much hope. They're, they're looking for a new season. They're looking for, for uh, you know, the sunlight to crack through the darkness, and, and that's what we're, we're going to bring that. Um, and a lot of them are saying, we have the confidence in, in you, Felix and Tony, that um, you guys get in. We, we, you're trusted leadership. We can work with you. And so just the, uh, a change of attitude, of mindset, of, of optimism and hope for a better future is what gets them up and motivated to, to make a difference. And yes, the problems are there. They will always be there as, as every society and community deals with it. But, but when there's a, a promise of a new season coming, that there will be change, that, that gets them excited and, and it gives them the confidence that says, you know, we're going to tackle this. And uh, we're looking forward to working with you. So the constant thing I keep hearing is we need you and Tony. We, you got to get in there. We need you. And, and, and we say, yes, with your help and your family and your vote, we, we can do this and we'll do it together. So I, and I always respond, we need you too. <laughs> so thank you, Tony.
And thank you, thank you our, our, our listening audience. Bless you. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful day. And we'll see you next week with Felix and Tony. Okay, adios. Felix and Tony.